Welcome, LA Progressive friends, family, readers. Uh, where Dick and I are just delighted to have um, an opportunity to talk to Mike Farrell. Uh, Mike is an actor and a human rights and social justice advocate. Um, he's also the president of um, Death Penalty Focus. And I, and I, I, behind, I mean, I'm excited about talking to Mike. Um, I wish that we didn't have a need for an organization such as Death Penalty Focus, but Mike, why don't you spend a little bit of time telling us about Death Penalty Focus, um, how you came to come into this work and just have at it. Okay. Well, DPF, um, Death Penalty Focus, uh, has been around since 1988. Um, I have been the president of the organization since sometime in the early 90s. Um, I was not one of the founders. I will say I was at one of their meetings, but I wasn't uh, Leonard Bierman and uh, Stanley Scheinbaum and a wonderful group of people who are unfortunately no longer with us. Um, got together uh, Tracy Rice, one of uh, one of our board members today, and uh, Bob Myers, another board member, um, were there at the founding. Uh, the organization was founded simply because California was in a situation where uh, the death penalty had been held uh, essentially unconstitutional in 1972, uh, was reinvigorated um, by the Supreme Court in 1976. By 78, here in California, uh, they, we had passed the law to reopen the death uh, penalty um, behaviors. Um, and 1979, the Briggs Initiative uh, even made it worse, um, and the um, process began. Um, we had uh, the first execution, however, and the defense community put up a pretty good struggle, I guess. Um, first execution didn't play, play, take place here till 1991, I believe it was, uh, Robert Alton Harris. And that was a case I got I got very involved with. Um, I had been involved in the death penalty work since the early 80s. Um, I was approached on the mash set by a minister from uh, Tennessee, Joe Engel, Reverend Joe Engel, called me and said, I understand you're against the death penalty. I guess I had signed a petition or something about it or made a statement somewhere. And he, I said, that's correct. And he said, I, I need you to help me. I need somebody to help me. Can I come out and talk to you? And he did. And we we talked on the set of the show. And he really impressed me and, and has remained a friend uh, until today. Um, and he was dedicated at that time to ending the use of the death penalty in the country. And it had, uh, since it had begun again in 76, um, uh, he ran the Southern Coalition on Jails and Prisons and asked me to come with him um, down to Tennessee, to Tennessee State Prison, to go through their death row, which I did. And that was, a, as you can imagine, a pretty uh, pretty emotional and uh, changing, life-changing experience to see these people mostly black and brown men, um, angry, frustrated, some of them clearly insane or with mental illness, um, some of them terrifically uh, appreciative of the fact that I was there, cared enough to come there. Some of them didn't want to talk to anybody. Uh, it was just but it was really a, a, a life-changing experience. And then I went with Joe to a fundraising uh, benefit in, I guess it was in Chicago. And then we went to a meeting in Alabama, I think, where I met some of the other people involved with the, uh, with the organization. And then in um, 84, I was involved in the effort against uh, Reagan administration's policies in Central America, and I was on my way to Washington, um, I think, to testify uh, to the House of Representatives about what I'd seen in Central America. And I got a call from this woman I had met on the with Joe's organization, and she said, I need you to stop here. And in, 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 I'm in Virginia now. 
I need you to, if you will, stop here. I want to introduce you to someone. And I arranged to, for a stopover in Virginia. And uh, she took me to death row in Virginia and where I met a young man named Joe Giratano, who she assumed um, or believed, I should say, was innocent. And he was uh, then on death row, scheduled to die. In Virginia, they had this horrific, <laughs> sort of unbelievable um, law that said that um, three weeks after you were tried, convicted, and sentenced to death, um, three weeks was the limit. After three weeks, no new evidence could be brought forward in your case. <laughs> I thought, well, that makes, that, that makes no sense at all. And she, uh, Marie Deans, this wonderful woman, was uh, involved in Joe's case and the case of a lot of other people on Virginia's death row. And uh, she said, I need your help uh, to get the governor's attention because the only way we can stop this execution is to is to do a full statewide campaign um public publicity campaign so i got involved in the case of joe geritano long story short uh, in 91 i was with him the day before he was to be executed and i remember sitting around the table we were plotting this um what was what, what was what was already in the governor's office? What he was going to do, and what if he didn't do what what we would do? And um, one of his attorneys, uh, Dick, uh, I'll blank on Dick's last name for a moment, um, said, "Mike, oh Joe, tell Mike about this table we're sitting. We were sitting around a table in the this lower ranks of the death chamber in." Uh, uh, in, ten, in the Richmond, Virginia. And, he, and Joe said, oh, oh, after I'm electrocuted uh, tomorrow, uh, two guards with asbestos gloves, because my body would be too hot to touch, will care, lift me up and carry me out here and put me on, put me on this table. <laughs> the table around which we were sitting. They, they, they call that the cooling table. And Jesus, I, I was, uh, you know, this is beyond my comprehension that such things could be happening and and to be in this in this set of circumstances um well i kept saying i keep saying life-changing <laughs> um I, I was just dumbfounded and and thank the ceiling as my friend uh, lance Lindsay used to say um uh they stopped that a governor stopped that execution it, and they they uh, they uh, transferred they 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 commuted joe's sentence from death to life in prison um until, until he had served 25 years on the basis of possible innocence and i said on the basis of possible innocence you're not going to kill him but you keep him in prison for the next, I guess, from that point, it would have been another 15 years. I, I, it was just, I mean, the, the whole process was insane to me. So I said, I, I, uh, I came back and I, got, I was involved then in visiting Joe and going uh, and have since that time and been involved in trying to get him out of prison and we finally succeeded um, after he was in prison for 38 years. Um, but I went back to California and got involved with the death case there. And then um, the uh, uh, case I mentioned, uh, 1991, when Robert Alton Harris was executed. Um, and shortly after that, Death Penalty Focus asked me if I would become a member. And I said, absolutely. What can I do? And so we've been... We've been trying since that time. California has executed 13 people in the uh, period since the um, since the the, Calif the the state reinstituted institute, reinstituted the death penalty, and in um, um, one of his early and courageous acts, Governor uh, Newsom declared a moratorium, so we do not kill people in this state anymore, at least until some other governor comes in and uh, changes things um but as it as it now stands we have one of the we are one of the 
what we call moratoria states. When we started this work, there were only um, 13 states in, California, in the United States without the death penalty. Uh, today, only 23 states still have the death penalty. And four more have moratoria. So we're actually in the majority. We've been trying to end the use of capital punishment around the country, around the world, actually, but around the country. And the, um, the effort has worked to the degree that we now have the majority of states that are not killing states. And most of the remaining killing states are in the South, as one comes to expect uh, with the politics uh, of this country. Um, well, so, so Mike, um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know very much about your life, mm. um, except for, um, you know, your, your acting career. Of course, I have followed it over the years, but coming from where you come from, you know, being um, a white man in America who lives, I would say, I'm assuming comfortably. Mm. How has this journey changed your ideas of what America is about? How America is experienced for so many other people who do not look like you? Mm. I mean, how has it changed your life? I, I would say um, completely. <laughs> Uh, I I was born here and raised, uh, born in Minnesota, but my folks moved out here when I was very young. I was raised in West Hollywood, California, before it was a city. Um, it was a county strip of Los in in the Los Angeles environs. And I, you know, I grew up in a situation where there was uh, there was a uh, there was some integration of um, mostly uh, Mexican Americans in the, our community, but and with our schools I went to. But I was not, you know, I was a kid and I didn't know what was going on and life seemed fine. My dad used words I would uh, rebel at today, but I, uh, I, I kind of grew up, I think, um, well, I, I was, I was, the, I was lucky, uh, obviously, in this society to be a white a young white man who was um, gifted with a, a lot of opportunities that a lot of other people didn't have. And that became a little more known to me uh, over time. But when I was in the military, I joined the Marines uh, out of high school because the draft was coming and um, I, the college was not on the agenda in my family. Um, and I remember uh, I served in uh, Japan, um, in Okinawa and Japan. And a lot of the servicemen were, you know, men, black men and Chicanos and people of all kinds of um, backgrounds. And when I was um, in Japan, I got to know a guy, uh, Tyus was his name. He's from Ohio. Um, he's a black Marine. And um, we, get, we became friends. And um, we went out on liberty together and I, I sensed when we came back into the into the, the barracks that um he, he went his way and I went my way and and there was this sort of difference um I didn't feel it when we were out on the outside in the streets but but in the barracks you could feel the difference and the same thing had been true in uh in, in boot camp in the marines so there was a big rivalry the DA, DAs were uh, DIs, I should say. The drill instructors were uh, <laughs> DA. It's <laughs> a Freudian slip. The DIs were uh, one was Hispanic and one was Irish, and and uh, I was his. I was the Irishman's favorite, and this the uh, another kid was the the Hispanic's favorite, and they sort of compa set up a combat between us, which was. Not fun, but it was what it was. So, so you begin this, you know, you begin. I was not a dumb kid, but I was pretty naive, and and you begin to get a sense of something's something's not right. 
um, when I got out of the Marines, uh, I came home and um, a friend of mine uh, had been, it was in the army and he joined the army and his folks asked me to drive his car to him in uh, North Carolina, Fort Bragg. And I did, and I went down, I drove, and I just chose a route down through, this is 1960, probably. I drove a, uh, chose a route down through Arkansas and into Louisiana and across to Alabama and Georgia. And, um, and I saw things that uh, I, I didn't think existed. I saw black poverty i saw and i realized you know, one of the things that i realized was that I, I was driving a car if my friend tyus the marine that i'd been hanging around with in in uh, in japan was with me he and i either couldn't sit in the same car or he'd have to be driving and i would have to be in the back seat and i thought jesus Jesus, some, something just is lousy here. But it was, you know, again, I was kind of a naive kid, and there was this was this was eye opening and 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 heartbreaking and awakening. Um, so, you know, I won't say I became a big activist. I just kind of began to be more aware. Um, and uh, you know, I was growing up, and I, I was maturing. I hope, and in uh, early sixties, uh, sixty three, I think it was, I got married for the first time, and um, things, you know, things. You look around, and things change. Um, but it wasn't until uh, you know Kennedy was a president that I was big, very proud of. I was stunned when he was murdered. I joined an or we fundamentally founded an organization looking trying to look into the reality of his assassination and whether or not it was what we were told um i'm one of those who never believed that lee harvey oswald was a soul if, if it was involved at all was a soul killer of jfk um but uh you know, I just, I, I continued to, I guess, grow and the blinders stayed on for a while. But I got lucky in the business. Um, I worked and I saw and I became more sensitive to what was going on in terms of gender disequality and racial horror, the horror of racial prejudice. And, uh, and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I got involved in the Central America stuff, and then I got involved in I, I, I got involved in I don't know how they all fit together, but involved in yeah. after after the Watts Rebellion, I went down and um, volunteered to help clean up, and um, got involved with an organization called Operation Bootstrap um, that was run by some people down there who. Um, we're trying to figure out a way to make change happen. Um, and that was, boy, that was oh, eye-opening and awakening and alarming in some many ways. Um, so, I, you know, a lot of this has continued. Uh, I continue to be white. Nothing I can do about that. Um, but I've tried to continue to be aware and sensitive and involved in the things that I can be involved in. And um, the death penalty, I, I more than you need to know, I suppose, but um, my this young marriage that I was 63, started in 63, the, um, it fell apart and I fell apart and uh, it was just a wreck, just a so just a total emotional wreck. And um, a friend of mine steered me to a um, halfway house organization called uh, the. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a, it, it was on the Manhattan Project in Manhattan Street in, in Los Angeles, and they called it the Manhattan Project, thinking that they could be as 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 
um, revolutionary as was the atomic bomb. Uh, and it was run by um, people from in people from prison, people from uh, uh, the streets, um, and two of the leaders there, three of the leaders there, one Hispanic ex junkie ex con, uh, a, uh, a a psychological social worker, and a psychiatrist helped us. And it was a group of people from every aspect of humanity, you know women with issues, men with issues, people black, people white, people brown, people whatever color you want. And we were all learning about each other and ourselves in the process. I remember, uh, if, if, if I may, <laughs> I remember one of the first group sessions I was in, uh, I've forgotten what I said, but this guy said, may I say uh, the F word? <laughs> I don't know if I can say it here, so I'll... I'll he, I think you can. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I, I said something, and he said, who the fuck are you? And I said, I, I, I'm Mike. And he said, what the fuck is a Mike? And I thought, I, 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 don't, know, I don't know how to answer that question. I, mean, I, I maybe need to, need to do some thinking about that. <laughs> And anyway, so I grew up in this organization, and um, their their premise was very simple: all any human being wants are three things: love, attention, and respect. And I thought, damn it, that makes sense to me. And uh, and I began to try to live with an awareness that everybody, all of us, want the same things in life. It doesn't matter who we are, what sex we are, what our sexual orientation is, what our color is, what our background is. We all want and deserve the same three things. So that has guided me, um, and it guided me into some interesting places. Uh, Black Panthers were um, barricaded in a house in... Uh, Los Angeles, at a point to where the police were um, threatening to go in after them. And I went, to, I rented a truck and got, I don't know how much, tons, it wasn't tons, but it felt like tons of food and groceries and um, beverages and things and drove down to this place and went up on the to the door and I said, I've got some food I want you guys to have. If you're going to be barricaded here, you're going to you're, you're going to need to eat and drink and sleep and stuff. And everybody thought that was just a gigantically outrageous thing to do. But I thought, shit, you know, what I know about the Panthers is that uh, they're not the dangerous group that people have suggested they were. Oh, um, I thought the danger would be coming from the police. I, well, of course. Uh, I didn't know. Or... <laughs> 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 uh, behind me around me you know, and right. I, I was i was just knocked out that they the the people inside this place and I, I don't remember how i found out the address but i had some friends i guess and i asked they opened the door and they said yeah, you know thank you you're you're welcome here thank you um so you know you do things uh, i got when i heard about what was going on in central america i got involved in central america when i heard when i learned about what was happening on our death rows i got involved in that and and it seems to me that that's what we who have the opportunity and the ability and the sensitivity to do things that can help uh, have an obligation to do absolutely man this is you know um I wanted to talk to you because the times when I've heard you talk on this issue, it's what you deliver, you project um, um, an aura of empathy that I think is so lacking. I don't, I mean, I could write an article or I could grab some content off a, a death penalty focus website that talks about statistics and where is the death penalty right now in California and where is it in the rest of the country and what's happening in the rest of the world? But I really wanted you to talk to us in the way that you do and you do it so um, effectively. 
You're, you're a man, an American man who has all the privilege that anyone could imagine and you care. And I think that that has really propelled death penalty focus for people like you and um, all the other people. Um, Sherry Frumpkin, who uh, introduced us, um, who is just wonderful. Um, yeah. We just we just need this so desperately. We need this <laughs> thing to end. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking yeah, we're, we're going to have our major fundraising dinner uh, yes. in a second. And um, I was thinking about what I want to say. And one of the things I want to say to the group that's there is the 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 benefit, but it's more than a benefit with the, the the wonderful richness that comes into my life and it comes into I think all our lives um, from decency, just decent human beings of wherever and from whom from whomever and from wherever. Um, allow us to be uh, whole, but it also they also allow us to relax and say, you know what, we're in good company here. And all we have to do is behave like we do here in this company with everyone else. And it'll be contagious. People will get it. People will let go of their fears and let go of their anger and let go of their frustration with the way life hasn't worked out for them they think um and just allow themselves to be loving caring capable human beings and wouldn't that be a great place to be for all of us to be just aware and living and caring about each other so as we close up um you were once on a panel, I think you were in, in, in an interview, and you made a statement about, you know, there are people, and, and I'm one of them, I think we should not have the death penalty. But then there are those who say that we shouldn't have the death penalty because our criminal justice system is so uh, corrupt. And the Innocence Project is a perfect example of how many people who have been exonerated um, wrongfully convicted, and this is one of the reasons we shouldn't have the death penalty. But even for people who are um, guilty, you talked about how there is no other crime where if someone is robbed, um, the sentence, right? So if you could just, let's close with that statement that you make about how we, this is just not the solution. <laughs> We don't rob robbers. We don't rape rapists. We don't steal from thieves. Uh, why do we kill killers? You know, yeah. if if somebody if somebody is so broken or so frustrated or so crazy or so messed up in one way or another that he or she actually takes the life of another human being, then that person needs to be is wounded and needs to be helped and needs to be separated, okay, from society and treated. And, 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 but you got, we must understand the fundamental dignity of, of human life, of every human being, and understand that those people who are living on the streets today are not people who should be incarcerated. They should be, they are people who should be housed and given opportunities. There are people in, the, in our society who can give great benefit to the rest of us if we just, in too many instances, shut up and open up and uh, allow other people's benefits and other people's gifts to be cherished like ours have been. Mike Farrell, it's been such a pleasure talking to you today. I want to encourage everyone to go to deathpenalty.org. Please make a donation um, and just visit the site and learn more about it and learn about the ways that average people can work together with Mike and all of the people at Death Penalty Focus to, to end this travesty. Thank you, Mike. See you sweet. soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.